Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm excited because, uh, as you can tell this morning, it was a little bit cooler outside. And right around this time of year, you know, Sugar King Festival season, we all know when it gets cooler, it's the beginning of gumbo season. So I'm excited. I mean, it's gumbo season, man. I hadn't had gumbo in a long time, it feels like. It's been months since I had gumbo. So gumbo is on the horizon. Mr. Benoit, I see you here this morning, sir. Three weeks ago, the Lord gave me a word for you. I wrote it down, and uh, I, I just, for whatever reason, didn't get a chance to give it to you. So I'm going to give it to you right, right now. Um, and the Lord said very specifically, he said, yes. It's the first thing he told me. He said, yes, your season has come. Make the move. Take the step. And he will pave the way for you. So I don't know what you're waiting on. I don't know exactly what's going on in your life. But I feel like the Lord is saying to you, yes, make that move. Whatever that looks like, make that move. He's with you. All right. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so today we're just going to continue again with our series. Uh, again, I thought this was a three-week series, but it has evolved uh, as, some, as it happens sometimes. So it's going to continue until the Lord says it's time to move on and to go into a different direction. So we're going to continue this series called The Little Black Book. And I've been really having a good time with this series because it just gives me an opportunity just to, to open up my book and see what the Lord is saying to me for that particular moment in time, that particular moment in, uh, of the day and the week as we move forward. And I, I feel like he's been speaking um, simplistically and profoundly all at the same time. I think the Lord has been opening, opening up our eyes and opening up our hearts to something important. And that's intimacy with him and just growing closer to him. And today what I want to do is I want to I want to look at an old idiom. Idiom is a common phrase used. And this popped up in my study this week, and, and I thought it would be appropriate for today. So I looked it up. And how many of you have ever heard of the, of the phrase, roll with the punches? No? Seth? No, Seth said he'd never heard of that before. So roll, roll with the punches. So I said, what is, I mean, that sounds good. Let, let me see what it what. What's the definition of roll with the punches? So boxing is believed to be the origin of the expression roll with the punches. The expression has been employed as a metaphor in boxing for several centuries. In a boxing bout, boxers will strive to angle themselves in various ways to decrease the effects of incoming blows. It's to adjust the difficulties one might encounter or go through. So I, when, when I think about boxing, because I've never, I've, I've never been a real big boxing fan, but when I was growing up, there was this guy who was just different than everybody else. And I'm sure when, when I say his name, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. His name was Iron Mike Tyson, right? He wasn't just an ordinary boxer. This guy packed a punch. There's another one of those idioms. He packed a punch. He had something about him that he was a brawler, man. No one wanted to fight him because he would knock people out quickly. I remember this one time we rented a pay-per-view. We were so excited about it. We got to see Iron Mike in his pay-per-view. We spent the 50 or 60, whatever dollars it was back then to rent pay-per-view. It's probably like up to 200 now, I'm sure. I don't, I don't even know. But it was like 50 bucks to rent it. And we were, they, they were just pumping up this fight. And it was this big old guy, man. He was, he was talking, talking his noise. Mike Tyson gets in the ring. The bell rings. He, Mike Tyson comes across, he hits the guy, and the match is over in like three seconds. Like, we just spent $50 to watch this bout, and it's over in three seconds. Talk about a big, what? No, there was no refunds involved at all. There was absolutely no refunds. But there was this phrase, there was this interview that they gave with Mike Tyson, and it was before he fought Evander Holyfield. Uh, they were asking about Evander Holyfield and about the fight. And this is what Mike Tyson said. He said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Everyone has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. How many of you have ever been hit in the mouth? If not by a person, by life. 
life has a way of packing a punch. And when you, when you feel it, you know it. And today what I want to do is I want to I talk about those punches. And I want to I talk about those seasons in our lives when we're just going through it. Because I, I want to start with something that Jesus said. And he said in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. For in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Sometimes those punches come from a place in life that you least expect. But the purpose is to create an opportunity for change. So what I want to do right now is I want to take a moment. Would you just join me in prayer? Father, I love you. We honor you in this place today. We ask that you would open up our hearts to hear your word, whatever it is that you have for us, God. We just we want to be sensitive to your word, sensitive to what you're saying, how you're saying it, and how it's going to apply to our own lives, God. Uh, we ask for your anointing to be upon this word. We ask that our ears would be attentive. And uh, we just, we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So what I want to do today is I, I want to look at this guy in the Bible. He wrote a third of the New Testament. It's a very familiar guy that I think all of us should know. If you are familiar with Scripture, you're familiar with church, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time. So it, it's a man by the name of the Apostle Paul. And I want to talk about the Apostle Paul because... If anyone knew how to roll with the punches, it was the Apostle Paul. So imagine if you're in a boxing ring and you're fighting and, this, and, and your opponent is throwing punches. Can imagine if you're standing against him and you're ready to fight. So, so if, if you're boxing, right, your, your dominant hand is supposed to go back, right? And your, and your weaker hand is supposed to be your your jab. So that's just how you stand. Imagine if your opponent takes a cut at you and he comes with a hook and you lean into the hook. That's going to hurt a whole lot, right? Because you're leaning into the punch. But imagine if your opponent takes a hook and when he's coming across, the hook's coming and you're f going with the hook. Which one is going to have mo more effect on you, right? It's the, it's the one that you, you lean in. Instead of roll with it. And I think for us, sometimes we think the best thing for us to do is just to fight every battle that comes our way and to lean into everything that hits us. The problem is, when we do that, we get worn out. Sometimes we think we can handle everything that comes our way all by ourselves. We're strong enough to handle it. And instead of rolling and just taking a break, man, rolling with the punch, just kind of going with it and learning how to decrease that, that amount of pain, we lean into it and we think we're going to fight against it and we're going to win. But most of the time we wear ourselves out to the point that eventually we get knocked out. I want to show you something in the life of the Apostle Paul because I believe in the steps that we're going to go through today, we're going to find ourselves being able to relate to this man in more than one way. Because Paul was a unique person <laughs> in a lot of ways. There's a reason why God created Paul the way he was. And there was a reason why God called Paul to do what he did. Paul was a determined man. And it all started on this warm summer day. My first point I want to make today is Paul the Apostle was, before he became Paul the Apostle, he was Saul. And this Saul was a very determined man who was very high and mighty in his, his holier-than-thou attitude about life. He understood, he understood the law. He knew he was a Pharisee. He was actually a Roman. His parents were Roman citizens. He was a Jewish man, but he was, his parents were Roman citizens, which was a high honor because you had all the privileges of being a Roman, but you also had the heritage of being a Jew. So he was unique in that way. For many of them, many of the Jews, they were not considered to be Roman citizens to have that honor of being part of the society or whatever, to have all the privileges of being the society. But Paul grew up in this. So there was a good chance that Paul had access to uh, resources that many of them did not, okay? So Paul grows up 
he grows up uh, as a Roman citizen and a Jewish man, and he learns from one of the greats. Uh, I, I believe when he was five years old, that's what it, when he was five years old, his family moved to Jerusalem where he studied under the famous rabbi. Hmm. What was that man's name, Betsy? Gammy. Gammy, yeah. Just Gammy. Gamiel. Ha, I sounded Jewish right there. Almost, I sounded, I had that little, anyway. Gamiel. Where, where he became an expert in the Jewish law. He became a Pharisee. So he was highly educated. He had resources. He had, he, he had, he, he had um, citizenship, and which opened up many doors of opportunity for him which made it, made it easy for him to become a high-ranking, have a high-ranking position uh, w- w- within the Sanhedrin, okay? So he became, literally, he became the Sanhedrin prosecuting attorney. <laughs> so Paul was judge and jury. He was, a, he was the ultimate judge dread. To the point where he would round up Christians and send them to jail and have them murdered. But this man that we're talking about, Saul, on this warm summer afternoon, on a road on his way to meet with, with, some, with, with his, his soldiers to go round up Christians, he had something that happened to him. And when we see it in, in Acts chapter 9, verses 3 and 3 through 4, it says, as he, as he neared Damascus, on his, jur- his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Can I tell you, my first point I want to make today, life has a way of throwing you off your high horse. Life has a way of taking you when you're at the peak of your our little existence and we think we have it all together and we've got it all figured out and things are starting to look like man I am set for the rest of my life life has a way of taking you (laughs) and knocking you off of that high horse that you sit upon Paul Saul was a man who had it all going for him and he knew it and he would go around and with his strong, high moral standards and strong biblical knowledge, he would use this knowledge to berate and to ridicule other Christians. I remember one of the disadvantages to start ministry at the age of 18 before you have any real life experience is that you don't, you don't have life experience. It's just that. When you become a youth pastor at 18 years old, you have no life experience. You don't really understand, uh, and especially because of my life, I, was, I, was, I didn't do very much. I didn't go to, I, I was in homeschool, so I didn't actually, I didn't go to high school. So 18 years old, I became a youth pastor, and I had to deal with a bunch of kids who I didn't really, I didn't understand too well. And because I was 18, and because I, I, I had a, a high opinion of myself, as we do when we're teenagers, uh, and that's fine, uh, but I had a high opinion of myself. I thought that my job was to discipline every teenager that came through the door. So if I had to discipline you, I disciplined you with my sermon. And the way I had to do that was I had to be real harsh. So there were sermons that I would get up and preach. I mean, come on. Uh, and I would you know, I would, tell my, I would tell the kids, listen, guys, you need to stop watching SpongeBob. And I went to, a, had a whole sermon on SpongeBob about why SpongeBob was not a good idea for kids to watch. And I even had pictures of the, you know, the imagery in SpongeBob. There was this one time, <laughs> there was this one time this kid was caught kissing a girl at church. Exactly. So they came to me and said, Pastor Ryan, (laughs) Pastor Ryan, so-and-so was just making out 
with so-and-so in this, on the side of the church. And I remember I like almost, you know, blew a gasket in my head. I was so mad. I was like, what? I'm trying to lead a group that is holy. I'm not even kissing girls, and I'm 20. So I, I grabbed him, and I said, come here, boy. Because it was my job. I'm, I'm his youth pastor, right? I felt like I was his daddy, too. And I gave, him, I gave him the lecture, and I let him know what he needed to know. And I said, you can't do that. By the, by the time it was over, that poor kid was crying. I had that poor kid crying. I was just trying to, I'm trying to save your soul, man. You want to go to hell? You know what I'm saying? Just real rough. Because I, was try- I thought what I was doing was the right thing. How many of you know it's easy for us to get caught up in doing something that we think is right, but in reality we're destroying somebody else's life? How many times have I seen Christians who were saved for years would sit in a, pul- uh, sit in a pulpit, sit in a seat, while myself or someone else is behind the pulpit and criticize everything that's coming far? forward. I remember this one time, I, I, I might have told you this, I had a lady who was just a real sweet lady, and she had started telling me, Pastor Ron, I love your sermons. Your sermons really inspire me. You're a young man, but you speak with authority, and you speak yada, yada, yada. All right. If you compliment it too flower, flowery, I get concerned. Um, but anyway, she's telling me all this, and then three weeks later, I got up here, and I was preaching on something. I don't remember what it was, but I mentioned the, uh, the show, uh, I made a reference to the, the sitcom The Office. I made a reference to The Office, and it was something about Dwight Schrute. She got so upset. She left the church because I talked about The Office. Now, here's my perspective. If you are, if you're so, if you're so holier than thou, that you cannot tolerate the mention of something as simple as a sitcom, you've got bigger problems than you know. Because most of the time, holier-than-thou people have inner core rot. And instead of trying to to give... um, to give the wisdom and the knowledge of what they've learned over the years to younger men and women in the church. They're sitting down listening to the pastor, wanting the pastor to feed them when they've been fed for way too long and they should be ministering. And so now they're critical of the pastor and other preachers that get up there because they feel like, well, you don't know as much as me. If you ever get to the point where you feel like you know more than the pastor, you need to check your heart because whether it's true or not, why, you have to ask yourself, why am I even thinking that? <laughs> I'm saying all that is beca- because Paul thought he had it all figured out. Saul thought he had it all figured out. In his mind, he was murdering Christians, and it was justified that he was fulfilling his assignment by God himself. I know Christians who take this book and use it as an axe, ha- axe handle, and they crush people. With this book. This book brings life, but there are people who put their perspective on it and they literally crush people and run them off. And I don't know about you, but I don't like the idea of having the blood of other people on my hands because I chose to be holier than thou and thought I had it together and I was right. And in reality, I was far from where I needed to be. Apostle Paul murdered Christians and he thought it was right. He was harsh on women. The Apostle Paul was harsh on men. He was harsh. And on the road, when he thought he had it all figured out, he thought everything in his life was, was just the way it needed to be and he was fulfilling God's assignment in, in, his, in his life, he met with Jesus and Jesus threw him off his horse. Listen, there are times in our lives where we just have to stop and allow an encounter with Jesus to take place. There are moments in our lives that the only thing that gets us out of our own self 
and our own selfish ambition is when we have an encounter with Jesus. And sometimes God will allow life to throw a sucker punch and hit you right in the mouth. And you something you never expected, just when you thought everything's finally coming together, life will just turn around and just hit you. I mean hit you where your teeth rattle. And you just think to yourself, what in the world just happened? Like those cartoons when they get hit with some kind of boulder or a rock falls on them, you know. And you see those little bitty birds dizzy. That's what life does to us sometimes. I can tell you multiple stories of getting hit in the mouth, and I'm not going to go there because we've got to move on. But this is the reality of where Saul was at this point in his life. So Saul has this encounter with God, and he was thrown off his horse, his, off of his high horse. He was, thought he was righteous. He thought he was holy. But he realized, I am nothing. He was blinded by the light of Jesus. And he was able to finally see for the first time in his life what was true, what was not. So you know the story. If you don't, after this encounter, he was blinded and for three days. And then, the, and then a guy comes in. The Lord sends a guy and prays for him. The scales fall off of his eyes and he can see. And from that point on, he was no longer known as Saul. But God changed his name to, the, to Paul. And he became known as the apostle of God because he had an encounter with Jesus. In order for you to become an apostle, you have to literally, according to that, that particular time frame in Acts, you, you, had to have, you had to have had um, a physical witness of Jesus. Like you, you had to see Jesus and you had to have an encounter with Jesus in that way. And Paul qualified for that because Jesus knocked him off the horse and he saw Jesus. All right, that was an encounter. So Paul, he became known as the apostle uh, the Apostle of Christ, the Apostle Paul. And, and uh, uh, the second point I want to make today is one of those things that I believe that many of us can relate with Paul uh, in, in this area and that Paul experienced physical and emotional problems. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, are because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore in order to keep me from becoming what? Conceited. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power will rest on me. Boy, I had this, this word, man. So there was... How many, I mean, you guys know, some, some of you are dealing with it right now, but there are a lot of different ailments you can have in this life. Like, I'm serious. If you ever looked up a medical dictionary, come on, man. And every, every single one of them, every single one of them, all of it is a result of the original fall of man. I know that's kind of like in general, but it's true. When Adam and Eve fell, they, disease entered the world. So it became part of the human existence because it became a fallen world and we eventually would die. And because we have, because there are so many different things, like uh, there are things like diverticulitis. I tried diverticulitis. Right? Diverticulitis. I don't know why that popped in my head this morning. But if you've got that, I'm telling you, the Lord is speaking to you. IBS or panic attacks and diarrhea. Diarrhea, what did I? That's not written down, y'all. Um, it's diabetes. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. I, but if you do have diarrhea, I mean, it's still, it's still one of those things. Diabetes and, Lord, help me, Jesus. Paul. Paul talks about he had this thorn. And if you do any research at all, most theologians, they're, they're um, split on what it meant. Because it could have meant that he had a physical ailment. He could have had a physical problem or could have been an emotional problem that he was dealing with 
imagine for me, with me for just a moment. If you look back at your past, and some of you can, some of you can relate with Paul in this area, you can look back at your past and realize the hurt and the pain and the sorrow that you cause in other people's lives. And even though you're forgiven at this point, you know that you're forgiven. Your life, you're forgiven. Jesus has set you free. You're forgiven. When you look back and you think back and you see some of the, the pain that you've caused in other people's lives, if you think about it long enough, it will cause you pain right now. I don't care how forgiven you are. It doesn't, it, 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 and that's the thing. You know, we can say, well, you're forgiven. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it still hurts because why did I do that? Why was I so dumb? Why was I so selfish? And we go through the whole thing. And the enemy loves to bring those thoughts and, and memories back because it gets us distracted on what's really important right now. Hey, you can't change the past. Not even Marty McFly could really change the past. If you had a DeLorean, you can go back in the, back in the future, back to, back in the future, back to the past. I'm okay. I'm, I'm serious, y'all. I didn't have my coffee this morning. I'm trying to get, a, it, it's just one of those things. Just hang on, hang on, buckle up. Even if you could go back to the past, you can't change the past because the past is over with. It's done. We look to the future. And so some believe Paul looks back. He can see, he could see the faces of the families that he had put in jail and he had murdered. He was at Stephen. Stephen was the first martyr written in, in uh, first Christian martyr that we see written in Scripture with Stephen is being stoned to death and Paul is, is there. They, they believe Paul was there watching it happen and they're hitting him with stones. And remember, uh, if you look back, Stephen looks up and he says, Lord, here I am. So it's just a beautiful story because he, he had an eternal perspective. But that's besides the point. We believe that maybe he didn't even feel that pain. I don't know. That seems impossible, but that's besides the point. Paul could have been looking back at all of the people that he had murdered and all the people he had put in jail, and he felt the sorrow of that. So regardless, if it was a physical problem that he had, that he was dealing with in his body that he couldn't get rid of, and it just, it was plaguing him, or if it was an emotional torment that he was having from the memories of his past, or how many, how many of you know what it's like to feel unforgiveness? Or how many of you know what it's like to be living in resentment? That maybe you feel like I can forgive him, but boy, boy, if I could. Like if you could pay him back and not get in trouble for it. Yeah, y'all know. You're like, if I pay him back, I'm going to go to jail, so I'm not going to do it. But if I didn't have to go to jail, I'm talking about resentment. You know, people have the capacity to hurt you. As a matter of fact, people have the most capacity to hurt you out of anything else on the planet. People are the most dangerous thing on the planet. Not lions and tigers and bears, oh my. People. Because we have words and relationships and emotional attachments. And, and we, have, we have those things, those physical things that, that, that tie us to one another. People are dangerous. But they're also life-giving. So it's this picture of we can't live without them, can't live with them. Pastor Ryan, what are you talking about exactly? But it's true. Paul, whether it was a, a, an emotional struggle, a thorn that he dealt with, or if it was a physical struggle, whatever it was, it was affecting him so much that he says, I pleaded with God to take it away from me. Have you ever knelt down or been in church or had an experience in your bed and just saying, Lord, I'm so tired. I can't do this anymore. The doctors can't figure out how to heal me. I've taken all this medicine. I'm doing all this extra work. I can't do it. Lord, I'm going to the psychiatrist. Lord, I'm going to counseling. Lord, I'm going to my pastor. Lord, I'm going. And I can't get rid of these panic attacks. I can't get rid of this anxiety anxiety and his fear and, 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 uh, and all of these things that just keep me up at night. God, I can't do this. Please take it away. Have you ever been that desperate before? But I can't go another day with these thoughts and these feelings and this physical exhaustion. And you get no answer. No matter how many times you feel like you plead with God, it feels like you get 
no answer. Paul said, I pleaded with God and I wrestled with God and he did not take it away from me. Instead, what did he do? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And when you're weak, I am made strong in you. Now, listen, that might not be that encouraging to you in your present condition. That might not be the flower, you know, the, the, the running through the tulips that you want to hear from your pastor. Never ran through tulips before, but I, I can see it. <laughs> Jesus, help me. That might not be the most exciting word that you came here for. And you say, well, Pastor, well, what do you mean? I mean, God's supposed to take away all my problems. God's supposed to take away all my hurts. God's supposed to take away all my pain. God's supposed to take away all my disease. He's supposed to take all these things. And, and, and you're just thinking, and life keeps, keeps hitting you. And life, life keeps swinging at you. And then eventually what you start to learn is, if I just keep fighting against this, I'm wearing myself out because every time I fight it, sometimes I'm, it's making the, the, the blow even more effective. And at some point in your life, you start to learn how to You think you're hurting me. Oh, I could box, boy. I got a long reach. <laughs> I told you, I just want to have fun. It's Sunday morning. I just want to have fun. <laughs> you learn over time when you get hit in, and you get hit in the mouth enough how to roll with the punches where, all right, I'm going to learn how to deal with this in a way where it's not going to knock me out. But instead... You can hit me, and you can hit me, and you can hit me, but I'm still going to be standing at the end because you learn to have endurance. You learn that God is still with you. He's in your corner. He's a, he's, he's a, lot, he's a lot more credible, credible than Mickey. Rocky Balboa's manager, for those of you who didn't know. All right, Mickey. Oh, come on, y'all. We're talking about boxing. We've got to talk about Rocky Balboa. No pain. <laughs> you, got, you got your manager in the corner, and he knows how to get you through this. He's going to wipe up your, wipe up your blood. He's going he's to wipe you up, keep you, keep you in the fight. Put a little Vaseline right there. For me, you know, just, you know, and I think about thorns, and I think about the things you deal with in life, I... I always struggled from a child all the way through adulthood. Struggled with feelings of inadequacy and anxiety for my entire life, really. I didn't know that I did, of course, until I had an emotional breakdown last year. <laughs> but when you go through those seasons in life, life, you know what? I got knocked down. You ever been knocked down? Just like, it's one thing to get hit in the mouth. But it's a whole other thing when you get hit in the mouth and you get knocked down. Because now you're embarrassed. Now you feel completely out of sorts. And you don't really know you, everything you believe and you thought you knew and you believed about God is now challenged. And you just feel like, okay, Lord, I don't even know if you're real anymore. Because I'm knocked down. And then you come to your senses. And you start to focus again and you realize, I got knocked down. But when I got knocked down, it was for my benefit. Because it woke me up. Made me realize I had to make changes. Made me realize I needed to deal with it. Because these thorns in our lives have purpose. Whether it's a physical problem or if it's an emotional problem, they have purpose. Paul served ministry in 20, for 20 years of his life. He was in ministry. Served ministry. And the third thing that I believe many of us can relate with Paul on is having to deal with tragedy and trouble. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to verse 20, 28, it says this, Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this, but I am more. I have worked harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again five times. I received from the Jews the 40 lash, 40 lashes minus one, which is 39. Three times I was beaten with rod. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. That's it right there. I've just, I'd have been done. I wouldn't have survived that, y'all. I'd have just been done. I'd have, I'd have went meet Jesus. In the, in the middle of the open sea, that's like, a, that's like a bad dream that I've had many times. Like my boat just sinks and I'm just sitting there in the middle of the ocean. And I see no land. That's terrible. Paul's a better man than me. He, was, he said he was shipwrecked. He spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles. Everybody wanted to get Paul. In danger in the city, in danger in this country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and I have... Um, often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. There are people that have gone through tragedy and experienced trouble. Like you're, you're in the midst of filing for divorce. You file papers for divorce. Or you found out that your spouse is cheating on you. Or you, you lost all your investments. I've heard of people... I'm, I'm kind of, kind of learning the, the principles of investments. And, and I've heard multiple stories of people investing their entire lives up until retirement. They get to 65 and the stock market crashes or something happens and they lose all their retirement. That is a devastating moment in a person's life when you've done the right thing and then all of a sudden you have nothing to show for it. I'm talking about trouble and I'm talking about tragedy. There have been people who have had to bury, bury their, their child. I, I've done funerals of people who have had to, had to bury their, their, their children because they died prematurely or uh, uh, whatever the reason was or someone lost their spouse too soon or you lost your job that you've been working 25 years and giving yourself to this career and to this job and something happens with the company and your boss says you're fired and you lose everything. Uh, guys, I'm talking about tragedy and trouble that we all face and we all experience at times. Paul, as he lived his 20 years in ministry, and all the experience, it seemed, was tragedy and trouble. Shipwrecked and beaten and, and ridiculed and persecuted and eventually thrown in jail at the place he wanted more than anything else to preach at. He wanted to be in Rome and to preach this gospel, and he was thrown in jail. Paul experienced tragedy. And listen, he was the apostle Paul. Paul went through it. Why shouldn't we expect that we're going to go through some stuff too? This is the reality that we all face. We all go through trouble. We all go through tragic moments. We all go through times that we look at and, and we just can't figure out why it's happening. Because, because God, you're supposed to take care of these things, right? I keep getting hit in the, I keep getting hit in the mouth. Over over and over again. Paul, he also struggled with sin. Did you know that? Did you know that Paul struggled with sin? Well, I'll show you what I mean. In Romans chapter 7, verse 15 to 20, it says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't, I don't do it. But what I hate to do, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good, and it is. And it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin that living in me. For I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, my, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I don't want to do. This is the thing I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I want to do, not what, if I do what I don't want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is a sin that living in, that's living in me that does it. Whether it is a person who's struggling with an addiction to, to uh, drugs or alcohol or food or pornography or, or money or self-focus, self-interest, whatever it is, power, whatever the, the issues that we're all dealing with, there's a struggle of sin and there are times in our lives where we just look around and the enemy loves to do this and he loves to do it to us all and you all know exactly what I'm talking about. But wait a minute. 
I thought you were a Christian. You just lied. You lost your temper. You cursed your neighbor out. You had enough of that neighbor who just didn't want to, you know, cut his, cut his grass or let his tree grow over your fence or what, whatever, y'all. It's not a good example. I have good neighbors. I can't give you a good personal example. <laughs> but, oh, whatever. Whatever that, that moment in time that you decided you were going to let the circumstance or those people get the best of you, and you made a fool of yourself. I told you the story again, and I have to see this lady at Walmart all the time. She's always in the front. I have trouble because I want to invite her to come to church. I just don't know if she remembers what I did. During COVID, she had a mask on. She's doing her job. I did not have my mask on. I don't remember why it was in the middle it wasn't like it wasn't like all it wasn't march april it wasn't the summer of the covid devastation it was like 2021 i think walked in walmart i already had a chip on my shoulder i could feel it i just knew somebody was going to tell me something so i walked in and i walked through the doors and she's standing there mask on she said sir I said, yes. She said, you got to put your mask on. I kept walking. <laughs> I'm embarrassed, y'all. She said, sir. I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I could feel every part of my body tense up. It's about to turn into Rocky Balboa. I just Rambo. It was about to be Rambo. It was Sylvester. Just, it was Rambo. And I, I'm telling you, I blacked out. Betsy was with me. I think you were with me, huh? She was, she was so embarrassed, poor baby. She was just embarrassed. So I, I blacked out. And I, I don't remember what I said. I didn't curse her out. That would be embarrassing if a pastor went and cursed somebody out at Walmart. That didn't happen. But I was really rude, and I whipped that. I whipped it. I think it was in Betsy's purse, and my pa was holding my pa, and I whipped it out. I said, fine. And I still didn't put it on. So I was a rebel. I was a rebel with a cause. So the other day I walked in, and there she was. She didn't have a mask on this time. But she's like, hello, sir. Welcome to Walmart. I said, hello, ma'am. How, how are you today? <laughs> we all struggle with things, man. And, and whew, those little moments like that I struggle with. I, I really do. So it was a moment in time where I really did not, was not a very good witness of Jesus Christ. And I'm pretty sure she, you know, but by this point she probably, I, all I could think was she probably knows I'm a pastor. So I have, I have to make that right. Um, Paul struggled with sin. And he tells us, I end up doing the things that I don't want to do. And I'm ashamed of it because of the battle that I struggle with. So the apostle Paul struggled with sin sometimes. Guys, how many of you know we're all going to struggle? He's the one who also says we have to what? Work out our own salvation with fear and trembling talks about how we have to learn to crucify ourselves. We have to learn it's no longer us that lives, but Christ that lives in us. And why is any of this important? And I'll tell you, it's very important for us because uh, we see in, this, in the life of this man, the, Saul, who was, who was determined to kill Christians. He was doing the right thing in his own mind. When we get caught up in doing what is right in our own minds without comparing it to what the Bible says, we are always going to end up in a ditch. I don't care how saved you are. I don't care, I don't care how much of the Bible you know. If, if, if our focus is more on, on, on trying to, to, to be this, this holy saint, that instead of loving people, we're going to end up in a ditch every time because that's not the call in our lives. The call in our lives is to love God and to love people. 
We can't do that if we're holier than thou. We just can't because everybody's going to offend us. Everybody is going to offend you. And how many of you know, I'm going to close, but how many of you know this is the most offended generation ever? I was having a conversation with, with Noah this morning. I'm like, bro, I said, everybody, I don't care what you, everybody's going to be offended by everything you say. I, you watch videos of these people. I'm like, Lord, what has happened? And I said, you know why? Oh, I was, I want to let y'all go. Oh, we got time. <laughs> I was reminding Noah of why I, I, I said, okay, Noah, you're 13. I'm not going to discipline you. I mean, the chances of you getting a spanking at 13 are very low. I have other things I can do to discipline you. I can take your switch away. I can do, you know, there's other, other ways I could discipline you. So I'm not going to spank you anymore. But I was like, let's talk about the time that, you know, I would spank you. How many times do you think you got spanked when you in your life? No, I was like, oh, about five. I was like, probably, like a handful. Not that many, because you weren't a bad kid. You didn't get a lot of, but you, you know why I spanked you? Yeah, Dad, you, you, you love me, and, and you're trying to, you know, teach me to do the right thing. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you know, you know, today, like, kids don't really get disciplined because you go to jail if you discipline your kids, it feels like. Like, are, are they going to go to TikTok? <laughs> oh, Daddy threatened to whip me today. Child Protective Services show up at your house. Did you threaten to whip your child? It's much more ridiculous than that, but I said, Noah, I said, a lot of people don't get, and, and I said, you know what's happening is everybody gets offended now. Like nobody gets disciplined. Nobody can be told they're wrong. Nobody can be told you're wrong, but you're, you're wrong. You know what happens to us when we can't be told we're wrong? We end up in a ditch after life punches us in the mouth and we can't get up from it. Because life will punch you in the mouth over and over and over again. And if we don't have a foundation, and what I'm going to show you this last point, if we don't have an anchor that we hold on to, we will Life will punch us to the ground and we will never get up again. And the anchor that we see in Paul's life, we see in our lives, it has to be this one thing and this one thing alone. And it's having an eternal perspective. What keeps us, what keeps us in the fight? What keeps us rolling with the punches? What keeps us waking up every day? What keeps us in church? What keeps us loving our family and taking care of our families and being kind? What gives us the, the, uh, desire to do what's right when doing what's wrong is so much more fun. What gives us a desire to live out, to, to live a life, a standard field life when we could just be doing whatever the heck we want to do because the culture says it's okay to do whatever you want to do. Because when you die, there's no heaven, there's no hell, and you just go to sleep. Honey, that's a lie. There's hell, and it's more than hot. It's eternal, and it's separation from all that is good forever and ever and ever. You can't just do all the things you want to do. Why do we discipline our kids? Because we're trying to instill in them. Life is going to discipline you a lot harder than I could ever discipline you. That's why. We teach our kids because they have, there has to be an eternal perspective. And I'll show you what I mean. What kept Paul doing? Going through the trials and the tribulations. Holding on to that thorn in his life. Whatever that thorn was. And dealing with his struggles of sin. What kept Paul going? What kept him in the game? Why did he keep fighting when he could have just gave up and just, just went and make a bunch of money and just continue to be the attorney of, of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin? Why? What kept him? It was this. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through verse 25. And it says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress in the faith. Paul was saying, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. See, the only thing that keeps us in this fight is knowing that in the end, we all win. When the bell, when the final bell is rung, you stand up on top and he raises your hand and he says, you're, you've won. You've done it. You've won the championship. You've won the fight. In the end, you win. This is what kept Paul in the fight. This is what keeps you and I in the fight. We know that there's an eternity waiting for us. If we live to be 100 years old on this earth, that's a, that's a small drop in the bucket compared to what eternity is going to be. Yeah, life's going to punch you. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Yeah, you're going to fight. You're going to have tragedy. You're going to have str uh, struggle. You're going to have to deal with, with, with uh, heartache and people are going to let you down. And, you know, there's going to be some, some resentment that you're going to have to deal with. There's going to be some moments when you have to fight with every core of your being to hold on to your faith and believe that Jesus Christ is actually real. But in the end, you keep rolling with the punches because you know eternity is waiting for you. I don't know where you stand today. I don't know if you feel confident or not in your faith, in your eternal status, in your eternity being secure. But before you leave today, we need to make sure that's secure. But for those of you who know that you're going to heaven and you're in this fight and you just feel like it's been getting rough, Pastor Ryan, you my, my man, my brother, my pastor, my friend, you, don't have, you have no idea how rough it's been. I've been feeling like I want to give up. I'm here to tell you something. Your manager is still in the corner with you. And he's still cheering you on. And he's saying, just keep fighting. But instead of always taking a direct hit, it's time to roll with the punches and give yourself a little bit of a break. Give yourself a break. Trust him. And I promise you, you'll get the victory. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word, for your guidance, your counsel. We thank you for your encouragement, the faith that you give us to believe that all things work together for good for those that love you and trust you. Today, there are some people that have been hit in the face that's sitting in this church. Life has dealt them blow after blow after blow. And Lord, for some, it just feels like it just keeps happening and they don't really know how they're going to get some relief. They just want a breakthrough. They want to be able to experience peace. They want to be able to experience joy and know that you are there. Father, today I pray, we pray together as a family that today is the breakthrough. That somebody in this place is going to experience a move of the Spirit of the Lord and they're never going to be the same. They're going to be encouraged because they know that, that your strength is empowering them. Because when we feel weak, you are made strong in us. That's our encouragement today. So if there's someone in here and you say, Pastor Ryan, I'm not secure, man. I don't know what's going to happen when I die. I don't know if Jesus, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I, I really don't. I, I feel like, you know, I've, I've done a lot of really, really, you know, bad things. I feel like my life is just going in the wrong direction. Um, but I'd like to know that I'm going to heaven. I want to try to do better and live right. That's you. I just want to tell you it's very simple. The Bible tells us that all we have to do is believe. We believe and we ask Jesus with our mouth to come into our heart and forgive us of our sins. He does it. So if you're here and you say, I believe, I believe in Jesus, 
Here's your opportunity to say, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Teach me how to live a better life. In Jesus' name, amen. That's the beginning. You've asked him to secure your eternity. Now, let's start working on your present and try to get your life back in order. It's a beautiful thing, but it starts right here. I want to invite our prayer team to come up. Uh, we're going to open up the altar for just a moment. We're going to give you guys an opportunity if you need prayer, if you need someone to pray with you. Maybe you're struggling and you say, I just need someone to pray with me. I, I, I don't want to go through this alone. This is a battle that I can't win by myself because I've done it. I've tried too many times. I keep leaning into the hits. I keep leaning into the, in, into the punches instead of learning how to... <sighs> and the Lord is just saying He's ready. He's ready to help you. But sometimes we just need to take the first step and ask. So I want to invite you to come. Like I, there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't come up for prayer if you feel like you need help. We want to give you that opportunity. And in just a moment, I'm going to dismiss you. We're going to go together. Uh, but I want to give you an opportunity to pray. So if you need prayer, the altar is open. Feel free to come. And we'll pray with you. In Jesus' name. We're going to continue to pray. Would you stand with me for just a moment? I just want to bless you. If you don't need prayer, I'm going to dismiss you today. If you need prayer, we're going to remain standing and we'll pray with you. But Father, I, I pray a special blessing over the people of God and our church. I thank you for Church on the Rock. This is your church. This is your house. We just pray for your protection over your people. Watch over us today. Cover us. Help us, help us to be reminded of who you are and what you've done and accomplished already in us. Teach us how to roll with the punches. Not to give up, but to keep fighting. Even when we're tired, Lord, we trust you. We give you the praise for it in the mighty name of Jesus. We all agree. We all said amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. You are dismissed, and we'll see you next week.